Okay. All right. Can everybody hear me? No. All right. I lost my. Uh, well, I had a little thing I was going to read. Now I got to find it again. Just a sec, and we'll get going. There it is. Okay. Ready? That's it. Good evening, and welcome to the Tri State Genealogical Society's meeting for, of May 2022. Uh, just wanted to announce that uh, we are in partnership with the Willard Library here in Evansville. That's our local genealogical uh, library, and uh, they've helped promote this tonight. I also want to let everyone know that our members, uh, or want to be members, we are changing uh, our board this year, and uh, I have a slate of officers that I'm going to read out for the officialness of it, and uh, then we'll get going. So uh, thanks to our hard work of our nominating committee chair, also known as Barb Manzi, I am presenting the following slate of officers for board approval, which we, the board has already approved them. So I'm just gonna, the, uh, for president, Barb Manzi, uh, we have a bank, vacant spot for vice president, if anyone's interested, uh, treasurer Ted Miller, and he will also cover membership chair, recording secretary Kim Van Vorst, IT coordinator Cassidy Cobb. Uh, program chair will also be uh, Barb Manzi and myself. Uh, and then we have board member Jane Saltzman and uh, board member Panetta McDowell. And uh, that was just for the record. If anybody has any questions or comments or wants to join in, just say, just email me at president.tsgs at gmail.com. Uh, also, you can go to tsgspaddlewheel.com and uh, you can see what all we have available for the public and for our members only. Tonight's program, as you all know, if you, can, if you checked in last month, we did a beginning DNA with Fatty Gillespie, and here she is again tonight to do intermediate, and I'm just gonna go ahead and look, tune myself out and turn it over to Okay. Um, I'm gonna go Okay, all right, so everyone is muted. I uh, just want to remind all who are getting a handout that I do recommend that you print it out in color. If at all possible, it helps make understanding them even more effective. Second, someone in the waiting room, but not joining. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Today's meeting is gonna be a little bit longer. Um, I understood that there were some who were joining that um, that weren't here last month and different levels of understanding. So we're gonna be doing a little bit of review uh, with some other incorporation. I think it'll make sense to everybody. Um, something weird going on here. Have someone in the waiting room who's not is struggling with this, but I'm going to go ahead and we'll get started. That's what I can do later. Okay, so then. Sooner or later, let's do this. That one didn't work, let's try this one. All right, there we go. No, we skipped a screen, didn't we? There we go. All right, so I've got my ancestry report, my ancestry DNA report, um, and we are going to look at evaluating our test results for connection. There's an echo, so somebody else is on. Okay. Um, well, I'll stop at various times during the presentation if you have any questions. Um, we'll go ahead and go on. Hmm. 
Okay, so I particularly like this one because we all know that Frankenstein came from parts of many people. I also particularly like the expression on the, doc the doctor's face behind him, who was a true Dr. Frankenstein, but we always think of the monster as being Frankenstein. Uh, same situation where R2D2 is looking at his ancestry, uh, at ancestry.com actually, um, all these different parts of what we're looking at. So genealogy. We're talking about genetic genealogy today, but we also need to talk about genealogy because uh, genetic genealogy cannot exist without genealogy. So DNA, looking at DNA, and I will say this like I said last time, it's just a bunch of numbers and letters. It's a blip on a, it's an allele on a chromosome and it doesn't have a name. And matching up the people that we're looking for or trying to find or putting names to those numbers and letters, like in the raw data, that's genealogy. But again, genetic genealogy can't do genealogy because they are a process of making sense out of numbers and letters, but genealogy puts a person's name to the process. So we should never feel that genealogy doesn't have a place. And as we go forward, you're going to see why it's even more important to do a really good job with our research, why it's more important to do a really thorough job with our sourcing and um, evidence finding, because we want to be able to be very sure um, who is actually related to who as we're looking for other potential donors. Okay, so who does genetic genealogy? Uh, lots of people, but there are those who are geneticists. That is not me. I'm not a geneticist. I'm a teacher by nature and by trade, retired teacher at this point in time. And I have been to so many DNA presentations through the years that I just felt like there was another way of teaching, another way of presenting, because the geneticists, the big names at the big conferences, they just love the complicated stuff. So they rush through the foundational stuff, information, I shouldn't call it stuff, but they rush through the foundational information, which makes it even more complicated to hold on and to understand the next step. This is um, one of my favorite um, visuals because this is what people <laughs> think. This genetics in action is actually the most detrimental picture to our understanding how genealogy works because you have the broad stripes, you have uh, horizontal stripes, there are the thin vertical stripes, and they have this adorable little girl while they walk on the boardwalk who has um, horizontal stripes, or she actually has thin horizontal stripes and wide vertical stripes. But the reality is it's all very evenly placed. And of course, this is making a point. Everyone gets 50% of their DNA from their father and 50% from their mother. On the other hand, if it was all evenly distributed, then every child that's born would look exactly like the other child. Isn't that interesting? If you have siblings, uh, just imagine that every, you may have some similar features in your siblings. Some siblings look very much alike. Some siblings don't look alike at all. And it's not as if there's anything wrong with that. It's just the way that it happens. But even if siblings have similar characteristics or face shapes or noses or eyebrows, they still are not identical. And this visual gives us the idea that this 50% is evenly distributed. But what is missing is that 50% also makes up how many generations of other people's DNA. And that's uh, called random recombination. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So let's start some of the review. Why test with ancestry? There are some questions that we ask ourselves or that people ask themselves or that other people ask us and we test then. 
Um, why test with Ancestry? Most people, I shouldn't say that. When Ancestry started, most people tested because of ethnicity. Who remembers this nice guy? Who his family had told him that they were German and he had Lederhosen and he studied that company and that he loved the food. And then he tested with Ancestry and it turns out what? They're Scottish. So here's Kyle. We haven't seen Kyle since then. I hope everything's well with him, but he, his commercial was marketing gold for Ancestry. Uh, their uptick in the number of people who took the test at that time was astronomical. But this is why people started testing with Ancestry, lucky for us, because that's what encouraged the turn to Ancestry to get the test done. Um, so finding ancestors, we test with ancestry because we want to find ancestors. Um, we want to qualify. Sometimes we want to qualify for heritage society, which is another reason to find ancestors. So we want to find parents and or siblings. And uh, because someone asked me to, because I didn't know other types of tests exist. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And the price was right. Ancestry does have the best sales, no doubt about it. If you ever have a chance or have a friend that's going to a national conference, the first in-person national conference mm, that took place this month in Sacramento. And I'm sure that there will be others who follow in the next year or two. But at the big conferences, Ancestry often sells their tests for like $39. So if you know someone who's going, um, I would definitely ask them to keep their eye on that. Okay, so let's take a look at this. One of the reasons that we test, if we're looking for ancestors, we wanna test with people who, with a company that has a large database. It's like, if we go fishing, do we want to go fishing in a place where there's only one or two fish or 10 fish? Or do we want to fish in a place where our chances of catching a fish are much better? And that's what's called the pond. And autosomal DNA um, is what this technical name for what Ancestry sells. That's what their test is. It's an autosomal DNA test. But other companies also sell autosomal tests. And this chart was just updated uh, by Leah Larkin, who is, um, I just forgot, she's a DNA something, just went blank, sorry. Um, but she's done a wonderful job with charting everything out. So you can see the colors up here in the key and the colors of course match this and Ancestry's at the top here. And you can see that they're up here and over here. So they've got over uh, 20 million tests. Now that's 20 million tests that have been sold. That doesn't mean that 20 million people have actually used the test. On the other hand, who's going to quibble by, even if it's a few thousand, who's going to quibble? They are far and above. Here's 23andMe. They are the next test to go. And you can see that they are about 12 million. So halfway behind Ancestry. So if we're looking to match ancestors within the autosomal timeline, then definitely Ancestry is a good place to go. Plus, you can download it um, and send it other places, and we'll talk about that later. Oh, that's in here. Understanding the ATDNA test. Um, ATDNA is the name of one test. There are several tests, several big tests, but this is the most popular test, and people call it the Ancestry test, but just as you heard before, it's an ATDNA test, which is short for autosomal. Autosomal is on is, is part of the 22 genes, chromosomes. There are two sex genes, according whether we're male or, or female, uh, but they're separate. And there are actually X genes, there are actually X that it can be tested. So autosomal are those 22 chromosomes that make up that gene. So also known as ATDNA. So when I throw around ATDNA, autosomal will be helpful. All right, 
it shows us the ethnicity of both our, our father and mother's line. Father and mother's line, both at the same time. And in fact, um, we'll take a tiny, tiny peek at what Ancestry has now done uh, with our autosomal in terms of our parents. This ethnicity defines a haplogroup, which gives us a certain place on the earth where we came from and where we're headed, where we settled, the very ancient kind of identification. Um, Think of haplogroup as a happy group. That's easier to remember that word. Also, remember, if you don't know, you now know that the autosomal test is the least reliable test. It's, it's, I don't know how to define that any further, but all the experts in the field will tell us that Ancestry's test is the most least reliable. Does that make sense? of the other tests and we had a long discussion on that last time and we won't be doing that today but it all has to do with um their algorithms which they keep tightening up and tightening up and tightening up and i know the professional uh genetic genealogists are really happy with the with the direction that ancestry is taking also it goes five to seven it will reveal five to seven generations of dna so you have to kind of figure too, I'm looking for someone who's how many generations away? They might be, if you just kind of take 25 years, kind of work with that, you get four per hundred. So you could be looking in the 1700s for someone who's a nine generation away and you'll realize that that isn't gonna work. And even so the seven generation might be eight, might be nine, but it really starts to peter out. Um, and it, it it's not as strong as it is in the five to seven. So if we're looking for family, one of the things we need to know is to continue to come up with a way of saying, what is it that I'm looking for? And then creating the process to find out that information. Okay, so what companies sell ATDNA tests? 23andMe, MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, Living DNA, uh, which uh, for those of you that are unaware, this is a wonderful company that's come up in England. Uh, they do a, almost like a tester test, a partial test, but they do an ATDNA test. Um, the best part about them is that, um, the best part about them is that Brits, British people are not as open and easygoing as Americans, and we've always been known that way to them. You know, us colonists, we're just really something else. So they weren't testing with the American companies very well, not in group, but now with Living DNA, and I haven't seen the recent stats for Living DNA, so I can't tell you. Usually when I go to the conferences, I get a lot more information uh, because there's a lot of people there, there's a lot of information going around and I don't have that. But Living DNA has had a positive response um, in the British Isles and people are testing with them, which if you have family in uh, there, you may, in the British Isles, um, and you're looking for family that you're related to in five to seven generations, you may definitely find more cousins. They, they you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh cousins, that's not a bad thing to know um, when you narrow it down to who your common ancestor is. All right, of course, ancestry is king. We just looked at those numbers and they sold twice as many as 23 and me. Of course, they spend twice as or more <laughs> money on advertising too. So, but that's good to know when we're looking. So, All right, we want to look at reference population and random recombination. These are big phrases. Um, I did put both of them on your handout under vocabulary. Um, so that will be helpful to you. So why does ethnic ethnicity percentages change? It has everything to do with reference population. And um, the reference population is how all the companies started. They took as 
they tested as many people as possible. Um, they created their own pool. They tried to determine who had, say someone was born in Spain, so who was in Spain for generations, right? So they're thinking this is a pure line and be, they look at what they've got and they table this and they examine it and they try to find the similarities there. So then they're able to say, oh, someone else looks like this. So they must be from Spain. So they set up all these, um, th this was their select group, um, their test group and everyone else was defined by that. Well, now that so many more people are testing, uh, especially with Ancestry, but all of them, it has changed how they can define our, our ethnicities because they have more people so to say, oh, well, that person we were basing off our Spanish um, ethnicity actually was part French, which is not unusual, or part Italian which is not unusual, or part Portuguese, which is not unusual. Um, so finding that out, that's how the genetics and the ethnicities are getting into to more of a region. Okay, random recombination is how we look the same or we look different from our parents or our grandparents or our great grandparents, or we look, like I said, the same or different. So let's take a look at some examples. We talked about this last month, and this is a, a, is a, a container, I can't remember the name of it. This is for lottery balls. You can tell here's the principle. You have a whole bunch of lottery balls, a set number of lottery balls, and only in this case, five can come out. That's like when you're testing your DNA. There, or you're born too. There's a set amount of DNA that can be absorbed onto one chromosome. So something's always going to drop off or segments are going to get shorter or they're going to stay large, which is also another clue and an indication of who we're related to. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But so there's, you can see in the back, there's all that genetic um, material And, but only a certain amount is coming out. And that is how each of us are created. So you've got your random recombination. Let's see another example. If someone says, can you give me change for a dollar? How many different ways can we make change out of a dollar? The same thing. You've got one dollar, but how many different ways can you make change for a dollar? But it's still a dollar, but all those different ways with pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters and two dollar bills and five dollar bills. Uh, oh, sorry, over one. <laughs> uh, you know, how many pennies, nickels, dimes and quarters and what percentage are you going to get out of the dollar? So I want you to think about that random recombination. OK, here's another one. Here's a bingo container you can see the g and the o and the i and the numbers so you've got all these numbers that are going to be rolled around before someone says and they'll announce it well there are only so many that can come out from all of them before there will be a winner so there's a world of dna out there before we're created the sperm and the egg have generations of data in them they combine to make a child. And then at that moment of creation, there's the beginning of this random recombination at that very moment. A random recombination. Let's take a look at this picture. The one I like the most is see how that little boy on the left, his toes, his toe actually kind of goes in a little bit on his right leg. Well, you can see the, the great grandson or a grandson, I've got this far in the way and I can't really see. You can see how his foot turns in just that little bit too. Of course, they look pretty similar. Haircuts, you know, they, hands in the pockets, but, the, but there's two generations separating them well, because that's random recombination. He's still got 50% of his dad, but he probably got a lot of DNA 
of his grandfather from his father that was in his father and, he, and his father gave it to him. Okay. Now here is a good example of two children, brother and sister. And yes, this does happen. And we know now that there's a phrase called passing that because of the because of the children of uh, relationships between ethnicities, um, between owners or masters or other circumstances, um, there was there were children that were born of parents, one black and one white. Well, sometimes they recombine, random recombination, they recombine. So one sibling could actually get enough of their ethnicity from their black parent and one could get more from their white. And oftentimes the white, the child of black family who looked light and or white, if we want to use that term, would do something that's called passing and they would leave the area which usually was the South, they would go North and recreate a new life for themselves. They didn't have to go through the same kind of lifestyle, the same kind of challenges um, that their siblings and their parents went through, which creates a whole nother societal statement. But you can see here, these are two children, their brother and sister, and it's all because of random recombination. I hope this is helping now. Let's take a look at the autosomal, which is another name for ATDNA that we talked about. This is the ancestry test. And if we start down here, you, here we go. If you look at these, both the brother and sister, here's their parents. And if you look at the colors, they don't have the same colors, do they? Well, this one looks similar to this one, but it's not. So let's just say you have yellow and green here. Well, you have teal and blue here, not green, and there's no yellow and there's no orange, but they come together and now the children have those four colors and different amounts. So this daughter got, the, got a big chunk of orange DNA from her father who has a big chunk of orange DNA, but look how far back it goes. There's the orange person. So one, two, three, four, five, five generations back. She's carrying, now see, big chunk of orange, big chunk of orange, huge piece of it, and then here's that. If you have any questions about this, I'll do my best to explain it, but it's really what DNA does. It usually gets smaller. It gets smaller as it comes down through the generations, but you can see her piece is larger than his. So she has more of her father's lines DNA in her. She may not look quite like her brother or they might have a similar kind of view, but you can see that they both have the same colors in different amounts because they're not identical twins. So they can't have the very same DNA pattern, but they have familial combination. So when he has children, it's very likely that he won't give very much at all. It could be a very thin line. That orange could be a very thin line in his children, or it might jump back and get a wide one again. Okay. They have the same ATDNA, but in different amounts. 50% of the father, 50% of the mother, but they each have a combination from their parents who carry combinations from their grandparents, who carry combinations from their parents. So all of us are walking combinations of DNA for who knows how long, almost time immemorial. So it's a great way to test. Again, five to seven generations, great way to test. But this is, a, this is the principle of why we look different from our siblings or why we might look like our parents, but look more like a grandparent because there's all that stuff rolling around, just like those balls we talked about. And then when it comes out and connects, to, then that's what we get, random recombination. Okay, so now let's talk about the test at Ancestry before we really go into the new material. This is the page um, 
when you go click on DNA at Ancestry, it'll take you to this page, all right? And usually the first place people go is to look at their ethnicity estimate. It's now located under the DNA story. So I've I highlined this so you can see this. Now see two other regions. Uh, they don't tell us what it is up front, but you have to click on it. It will take you there. So let's let's do that. Let's look at DNA story. All right. So here's my DNA story. I, oh, I'm going to show you how to do it. Sorry. DNA, I'm click on DNA. I'm going to see that. I'm going to go to my DNA results summary right there at the top. So and then we get back where we were before. I'm going to click on it. That's got four regions in there. And here are all my other regions. This is interesting to look at how many other regions are tested. And I really do like the color coding that they use because here is Norway. 1%, Wales matches, here's that tiny little country right there. I can, Germanic Europe is right there. Of course, England and Northwest Europe is um, right here. Ireland is right here and Scotland is right there. All right, so there are, this is considered together. They're doing this together, but this is Greenland, this is Iceland. And I don't know why they do that, but that's what they do. So it's kind of fun to say, oh, okay, okay, that's that's what I made up of. And if you have any family from Ireland or Scotland, it's not at all unusual to have um, Norwegian in us. This is a very low amount in, in some ways, but because the Vikings were sailors and plunderers, um, they like to come to the closest place, which was here or here. So um, it's not unusual at all. So this is my ethnicity estimate. You can see that it, I tried to match it up. This is a prior year. Ireland has gone down, uh, it was 36 before, it's 30 now. England and Northwestern uh, was 13, it's 27. Germanic is three, uh, 10 and 2% is Wales and we don't even see Norway anymore. Just a little blip there. So, it's going to change. So here's 2020, 50% England, Wales, Northwest, and they've just rolled it in, 48% Ireland and Scotland. All right. And this is, this, this is another estimate that came out. All right. 27% and 50 plus five other regions. That was older. And then this is the 2020. And this is the most, I, this is the most recent I did for this one, for this presentation. So you can see 50% and 40% and one other region. So the minor regions, there were five before, but there's only one now. So it's just getting tighter and tighter. And I wonder when Ancestry will actually begin to be able to pull us into an area in Ireland, and Scotland, and England, Wales, and Northwestern Europe, but we'll see. Right? Taking a look at the report again, we can look at the side I think it's called sideways uh, process that they've begun. They are taking our DNA and they are literally telling us um, one parent is made up of this and another parent is made up of that. Um, now I know my grandfather's lineage was straight from Scotland and my grandmother's lineage was straight from Ireland. Um, her family lit, was in the U.S. much, much longer than my grandfather. Now, my mother, of course, is a combination of the two of them. But I got a really big chunk here of both. So Irish and Scottish. and um, But it's just kind of interesting to look at that um, and see that. So we have this tiny little bit here. Here's Norway that we looked at earlier. Uh, here's Wales right here. Um, but it's pretty hard to tell them too much apart if, from my parents at this point in time. But it has lots of potential, so keep your eye on this. Ancestry is famous for their bells and whistles. So if you like to ring the bells and you like to hear the whistles, then definitely always look at the stuff that they're doing. But now we're about to take a look at some other things. All right, so we just looked at this. You can see they're all there, um, kind of fun especially if your parents are dynamically different from different
places in the world, that would be a fun thing to see. All right, we're gonna take a look at through lines, which is right here. And what we need to understand as, um, is that through this official statement, through lines uses ancestry trees to suggest, suggest is the word they use, how you may be, may be related to your DNA matches through common ancestors. What they're doing is looking at your trees, determining who you are related to in a straight line, through lines, so a straight ancestry me to my father, my father's father, my father's grandfather, etc. Uh, according to the tree may be related. And I know that we had a little bit of discussion on this last month, um, but it is something that we need to talk about. All right, so as far as I know, I don't know any differently, one way or the other, this is my father. He doesn't seem to be my father, um, but he hasn't been thrown out yet. This is my mother. And this is what happened when I, this is what came up when I looked at the through lines for my father. Zero DNA matches. You are currently the only DNA descendant connected to this through line. Okay, there are reasons for that. Number one, descendants haven't tested with ancestry. I find that hard to believe, but that could be the case. People are still testing that have never tested in their families. So maybe I'm related to them, maybe I'm not. According to Ancestry, there just aren't any matches. And so they can't give me any information. They're politely and kindly saying evaluate relationship paths, which means you might really might not be related to this person. Okay, I can work with that. However, then my mother gets the same information. Now I'm definitely my mother's daughter. You can see that in our appearance and life story. And the, apparently there's not any DNA here to prove that. So that makes me think, well, maybe I am related to my father. If this is what comes up for my mother. So even, so you can see that there is some confusion here. Um, last time I also showed a slide where my tree says that he, that this is my father and his grandfather is listed as my great grandfather, because that's what my tree says. Notice up here too, these through lines are generated using DNA results that are linked to the tree, but they're not using DNA results. They're just saying they have no DNA results. Okay. If they have no DNA results, how did they even no, to put that in the other slide. All right, so here's the most important one, DNA matches. All right, let's look at DNA matches. This is the most important part if you're trying to use DNA to find other family members or find ancestors. So here is my DNA results. Notice that I am separated. Close family, there's one person, second cousin. I have several of those. Two of them do not have trees. This close family has a very large tree. This one only has three people in their tree. Now I can add myself to their group um, so that I can communicate with them more effectively. Another thing about Ancestry, they don't share your email address. All communication has to be done through Ancestry. Um, in order to do that, that's great, you can do that, but not everybody is an avid genealogist. Not everyone comes and checks their messages that they might have received. So it is a little bit more offish to try and it more difficult trying to contact someone who is on Ancestry that we may be related to, but doesn't check their messages very often. Um, a lot of us wish they would change that. All right, so here's my close family. Let's take a look at that situation. Right here, I've got 1,871 centimorgans. That's what CM stands for. Um, I did put that on your list, so that becomes part of your vocabulary across 36 segments. The more centimorgans you have and the more segments you have indicates the closer the individual is to you in a relationship, in a genetic relationship. 
Okay, so let's take a look at that. I click on that and the same thing is repeated. Unweighted share DNA. Um, we're not sure why it's not weighted, but the longest segment is 167 centimeters. Now we're going to look at some segments later, but a long segment is just like that orange that we talked about in the in the daughter. What a big chunk she had. Well, she's going to have a long segment of her grandfather's orange. Her father had a little bit but I'd be willing to bet combined with the grandfather, she got more and she passed it on. So we have quite a relationship, but they're not gonna say anything else except that close family relationship means that I could be related to parent, grandparent, grandchild, half sibling, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew. Okay, couldn't get more vague than that. You'll see when we look at 23andMe that they are very specific on how that works. But those of you that have your handouts can jump to the end of the story by turning to one of the uh, charts that I've sent you and find about 1,871 centimorgans. That will give you the clue of how she is to me, what her relationship is. All right. So now I want to, we want to start with a research plan. We've already talked about this. We have to do genealogy to put names with the data. It's the only way. So I know I have a relationship with someone who with uh, 1,871 centimorgans. Um, and in order to find out who she is, of course her name's there, so it's not quite the same thing. I need to know her name. We know we have a relationship. Now we have to discuss where that relationship came from if that's not available at the time, All right? So we're going to create a research plan. And honestly, this is the very best way if you're trying to find family or you're trying to find ancestors is coming is using a plan. You want to formulate the research question. We're gonna look at that in a minute. You want to collect evidence. Evidence in DNA is going to be more than just the centimorgans and the segment. It's also going to be looking for people, other people that have that same segment, seeing where they live, creating conversations, um, placing them geographically in an area. And if you have something like you're trying to find parents or a sibling, then you want to be able to see where people were close enough to have made contact for children for further relationships to have occurred. So collect the evidence, analyze the evidence, create a hypothesis. Does this sound familiar? Kind of like college science or high school college science classes. Create a theory. Yes, I think I'm related to, or I am not related and then proof. Okay, the, there is proof in the DNA. And if the proof isn't found, then what do we do? We reformulate the research question, we collect more evidence, reanalyze the evidence, create the new hypothesis, create a new theory, and still we're looking for proof because an acceptable hypothesis is based on analysis of the evidence. About three years ago, I think it was three, Ancestry decided to get rid of everybody that was more than a 4% relationship, which certainly cleared out a lot of relationships with people that just disappeared. They weren't very close. On the other hand, they also eliminated a lot of clues. So remember that when we get to a chart, like right here. Here is a chart. Uh, this is Blaine Bettinger's chart. I actually contacted him for permission. It showed up on Facebook. I haven't heard from him, so if he, uh, says no, then I'll have to remove this from the presentation. But here is a good example of a chart that we can create without, we can do it on a pad of paper and a pen. We can do this with certain sites that give us this opportunity, but I wanted you to see how this works. So they're starting with two takers that are obviously related. They give the relationship there. This is previous, this is new, pops up. And so we wanna find out how they're related. And the point is that we want to know who is, the, who is the common ancestor or the common couple. 
that's the whole point of going through everything. But we have to start in the present. And then we begin to look for other people who share a lot of segments, a lot of centimorgans. And there's different places we can go to do that. There's other sites. There's uploading our raw data uh, to get into other pools that may not have tested with Ancestry. And we just go, we go back and we go back and we go back one way or the other. And then we realize, oh, okay. So these two are sisters. You're gonna find out that they are. And so this is how you get down here to the third cousin twice removed from once removed. It's not a complicated process. Just wrap your heads around. You're just creating, instead of a family tree with names, you're creating a family tree with relationships and matching the DNA to those relationships. If, as you can see, there is enough shared centimorgans. This is just an example. All right. So let's talk about downloading to upload. This is what raw data is. When we want to download our raw data from where we've tested, this is what it looks like. When raw data, uh, when people realized they could download raw data, there was a lot of talk and uh, a lot of opinions and a lot of scare tactics about what raw data is. But this is just what you get. Here's the chromosome, which chromosome? There's 22 chromosomes. The position on the chromosome, which allele are they on? A, B, C, G, and we have certain letters that are attached to, not, not B actually. Um, to the understanding. So if you, if you want to fish in other ponds, you want to find other family, if you want to seek other ancestors, you want to seek ancestors, you want more relationships to strengthen what you're trying to establish, then that one of the answers is to download your raw data. It's free to do that. You can do that as often as you want to. All right, here is me, and we're going to talk about how to do that. You're going to go to settings when you're in the DNA part, right? You go to the DNA settings. And then on the screen, there will be a place that says download raw DNA data, or you can, what is DNA data? You can read it, but you can also see it says download, but oh, this is all not, here we go. So here's settings, download DNA data. So we're going to click on download. You can see by the print, that's a hot link. So this is what we're going to do. And this is what it looks like. It's a zip file. It will always come with a date. Last month, I showed them two. This month, I'm showing you three because I just wanted to see if it still worked the same, and it did. So I've downloaded it three different times. It's the same DNA. It's the same numbers and letters every time. They're just evaluating it differently with the pool that they compare it to, okay? Now here are the DNA, major DNA companies. You can download the raw data. Yes, all of them will allow you to, raw, to download your raw data, which they should because it's your DNA and you paid to have it tested. So the one thing you get besides you should have access to, the one thing you should have access to is your own DNA data your raw data. So yes, they all do. No matter where you've tested, you have access to download your raw data. Now, will Ancestry allow you to upload raw data? No, they don't. You can download it, but they won't take outside raw data. Family tree will, my heritage will, living DNA will, and 22andMe will not allow you. So the two biggest companies, Ancestry's number one in sales, 22 and me is the second in sales, and they do not allow foreign DNA in their system, which is a pain. But 22 and me has a really checkered history when it comes to DNA. First they had trees, then they eliminated all their trees. First they did other testing, then they eliminated other testing. Then they decided they were just going to be a medical company and their profits just went to the basement. So then they decided to come back and be a DNA testing company and offer the health test. Um, so they've been a little confused according to their board of directors and their, uh, 
their goals, but they are here now and they still will not allow you to upload your raw data. Download your own, but you can't upload from anywhere else. All right, so why use other sites besides Ancestry? Main one to get match results for matches that Ancestry missed. That's the very main reason. Now, to compare your cousins with each other, there is no tool on Ancestry at this time that allows you to look side by side at someone else's DNA. Ancestry doesn't do that, but the other companies do. All right, another thing is Ancestry has no tools that allows you to compare batches of three to 10 people or more. It's called a 3D chromosome browser, multiple hit analysis. Ancestry doesn't have that. So by uploading your raw data, you not only to some companies, depending which one you do it to, you have access now to actually do more analysis right there at the company. Oh, sorry. Then to you, you can easily distinguish full siblings from half siblings. Ancestry has no such feature. Notice when I said that I had close family, there were six different relationships that 1800 plus uh, centimorgans on that large section, 167, I, I think, section segment. So, and you can't do that on Ancestry. Also, we'll talk a little bit about GEDmatch. Uh, visual phasing is something you can do if you want to visually take a look at your chromosomes, uh, which you can also do on 22andMe. I don't have a lot to do with my heritage, so I'm not really knowledgeable to speak with on them. But Ancestry does not allow you to do that. Uh, GEDmatch has chromosome browsers. Ancestry does not. And I can't see the thing at the bottom. Okay, so why upload my ancestry results to other DNA tests for this reason? All right, we talked about this last time, so I created a slide. Every company has a different way of evaluating their DNA results. One would think that there's only one way, but there isn't. There's more than one way, just like cake recipe. <laughs> um, Cake recipes from these three companies that I'm going to show you have been around for a hundred years. And they actually have patents and they're trademark registered and they guard their secrets very well. It's vanilla cake. You wouldn't think much about vanilla cake, but this is a very guarded secret because they have a specific recipe to make this flavor. Some vanillas use a little lemon in it to give it a little different flavor. Some use a lot more vanilla. Um, some do whatever they do to make it not quite the same thing as the other person. So here's Pillsbury and here's Duncan Hine. All vanillas. Uh, French vanilla is a little out there, but I couldn't find just a reg Duncan Hine's regular one. But here are companies that have always sold vanilla, yet, they're all vanilla, yet they're all different. All the DNA com companies use an algorithm that are basically the same, but still do things a little bit differently. So if I want to test for Native American, I know that I will test with 23andMe because they are the ones that have done something to their recipe also known as algorithm, that they are able to identify that a little more clearly than any of the others. If I'm looking for a, if I'm looking for Sephardic Jews, I will want to go to Family Tree and Me, because they have been able to determine um, the gene that was developed through the centuries in the Sephardic Jews. Um, if I'm looking for, and I forgot the other term, please, I'm so sorry. Um, if I, there's another Jewish group, then I would go to, um, not family tree and me, 23 and me, who are also very good at determining them. So uh, when you think about why do I want to upload my raw data? Because first off, it's all going, it's going to be somewhat different from what you got from Ancestry. Ancestry is king in terms of sales. They're not always king in terms of ethnic analysis. 
So if you're just interested in ethnicity, it's very interesting. Um, at the same time, you're also going to find other people that you may have a relationship with means that you have common ancestors together um, by going to, going to other companies. So here is my first year, right? You can see that from, you already saw that it was Ireland and Western Europe, Great Britain. Um, and then here's the first one right here. And it was still here the second time the changes were made in 219. This is 218, by the way, 219. Um, you, but here's the different company, okay? Ancestry said this, but 23 Me didn't. But they did say a little bit of this, Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain and Portugal. Italy and Greece, they're, they're there. And 219, Ancestry says, no, I don't think so. But 23andMe still says that I have family in these places. Uh, having someone like Caucasus was cool or Finland or Russia, but it's over here, FTDNA. All right, here's the last one. Um, you can see that Ancestry is, they just, shot it to just, and I'm trying to balance them out between all three companies because I want you to see 23andMe is giving me this same kind of number. I'm trying to compare them, German, Scandinavian, there's that Norway and that we talked about, a little bit of Southern Europe, which is important to me, uh, but they also find that I have this tiny, tiny little bit of Native American slash East Asian because there are similarities in that DNA. FTDNA also just broke it down. West and Central Europe. West Europe is, of course, Spain and Portugal and France, things that we talked about before. But there's a difference here. You can see there's a difference in the way that they're rating our ethnicity. So whenever I hear someone say, oh, my ethnicity is this, and, and I'm listening, or that we're talking, I say, well, who did you test with? And most often, because it's big cell, they'll say ancestry. And then I'll say, have you tested with anyone else? Oh, no, I don't want to buy their tests. You know, this is, I'm fine with this, but you don't have to buy their tests uh, except for, you know, 23andMe. If, and, but if you do, you find out that there are differences in the way your ethnicity is being read. So sites that evaluate uploaded raw DNA, you can see lots of them right here. We're gonna talk a little bit about GEDmatch. But these are the ones you really want to do and want to become learned in. Um, at the end of the presentation, um, oh, it's already seven o'clock. So at the end of the presentation, we're going to talk a lot more about education and how you can learn more about these things. Phasing DNA Painter is a site. Uh, visual phasing and triangulation is a process, just like phasing, okay? So chromosome mapping is another one. It's a process, not a site, but you can do different things at different places. All right. So we want to evaluate relationships by centimorgans. We've already talked about CM is centimorgans and centimorgans is just a measurement of size. Like one inch is different than two inches, is different than three inches, but they're all inches and they're all measurements. Centimorgans is a genetic measurement. It's not complicated. And the, the more we have, remember what I said, the more centimorgans we have and the more segments we have, the closer the relationship will be and vice versa. So, but sometimes we need those people that have less of a relationship because we realize our common ancestor is a little bit further away, a little bit further down the path. So we talked about my family, my close family, all right, so we, here we get 1871, sorry, 36 segments. And so if we look here, 1831, but it's average 1700. So we have to be generous with this. Now that brings me to your uh, handout. If you have your handout in front of you, you can see that there's a chart by La Schubach that's on the screen, it's also in your handout. Um, that gives you the relationship, the average shared centimorgan, and the approximate percentages because uh, 23andMe uses percentages and not centimorgan. Just FYI. So you've got another chart in there, and all charts now use percentages and centimorgans. 
Uh, if you turn the page, the shared CM project, and the newest one was done in March 2020. It was updated by Blaine Bettinger, the famous Blaine Bettinger. Um, and I want you to realize that what this is, is volunteer. People have, he's brilliant. The man is brilliant. And what he's done is he's said to the general public saying, if you have, if you have a confirmed relationship using your DNA, send it to me. Because what he's been very concerned about the wibble wobble between the amount of centimorgans uh, that are used to define these relationships and people getting confused because of the differences there. So he's created a new chart and a new way according to those people that the relationships in to determine how many does it take. Okay, so a half sibling is 1700 on this one, and Blaine says it's 1759 between 1160 and 2436. So the average is 1759, but some half siblings have even more. So if we're using one chart and we sit and we say, oh, I have, I think I found a half sibling, and they have 2,000 centimorgans. None of the charts allow for that, but Blaine Bettinger does. So when we're looking at relationships, we have to get a lot of education about how to use them and be open to the fact that it's not just like it's written down. All right, so all matches. I'm gonna look at all my shared DNA at 23 and me. And here is that individual that I said that I have 1,800 some odd centimorgans and 36 shared segments. The purple is all of, this is what you can do when you compare on 23andMe. All of this is we have the same. We share all of this. Never heard of this person until this she popped up on 23andMe, right? Right here is the key to who our common who our common ancestor is. All right, male or female. One X is male, two X is female. So we share the same father. We're still in the stage of trying to determine who is our father. <laughs> she that's a whole nother story. Anyway, we've not made a lot of progress there, but you can see a little bit of what that looks like. Here are here are the chromosomes. An interesting thing to recognize is one has more chromosome material in it than 22. See their size? Isn't that interesting? Not just the shared, but the size. Even though there's a little bit of, mm -hmm, you know, there's some, some are similar. Generally, one is the longest one, two is the next longest one. But, but also, that's, a, that's helpful to look at. But we have these big chunks. These are the segments right here. This is a close relationship. And 23 and me will tell me that she's my half sister with a huge amount of shared cinnamorgan. Huge amount. Whereas ancestry me would only say one of six. This person is one of six relationships, which is another reason why you want to upload your ancestry data or test with another test if you're looking for relationships to help you, our ancestors. I don't know why it's doing that, I'm so sorry. All right, so here we are here. We're looking at first and second cousins. We have the same situation. We're looking at their centimorgans. Hope you're getting used to that word or CMs and their segments. Isn't this interesting though? So 621 over 16. So I have six more centimorgans here and less segments than this one. So less centimorgans, more segments, more centimorgans, less segments, but that's what we talked about. That is the very phrase that we talked about to begin with, the recombination. All right, so in order to maximize our ancestry, we want to do these things. First off, we want to build a tree that's accurate. Well, sometimes changes come, but please change it. If you discover your tree is differently, change different than change it. I haven't changed mine, so I'm talking to myself, not just to you. Uh, link your DNA to your tree. If you have a tree on Ancestry, if you have a tree on 23andMe, if you have a tree somewhere else, link your DNA. 
that will help you to find other family members because that's the way ancestry works. Try to connect with other people. Uh, I will reply to all who contact me. I will reply kindly to those people who are annoying and yes, they're out there. I will contact those to whom a relationship is strong, but I will not continue to contact them. Beware endogamy. If you've done the paper trail genealogy, you need to know that if you have family that came from a community that shared a lot of DNA among descendants, first cousins, my grandmother and my grandfather were first cut, my great grandmother and great grandfather were first cousins. That is a little bit endogamous. If there is any group that's separated by um, mountains or rivers or an island or political affiliations um, or all kinds of different examples, there is an endogamy. And endogamy is a whole nother problem when evaluating gene genealogy, when evaluating our DNA. So just want you to have that word and, it, and the definition is, look at these, Jews, Polynesians, they're islands, they travel together, low German men, Mennonites, Amish, Acadians, or Cajuns. Acadians was what their name was when they lived up in Canada. Uh, Cajuns when they came down to Louisiana. Um, Nova Scotia is Canada. So French Canadians, because they swarmed there and they all lived together. So we got Arab countries, Newfoundland people from Ireland. ISOG is in your, uh, is something you need to know. That's the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. They have a wiki. It's a wonderful place to go to have, def to obtain definition. All right. Organizing our family findings. The first thing we want to know, we want to have a goal. So who is the MRCA and what does that stand for again? Most recent common ancestor or most recent common couple because we might be looking for family. We might be looking for not just one person but their spouse or the father or mother. So here's another, uh, another tree that you can kind of gift. Here's myself, my half sister, parent, and I can't do that until I can verify my parents. All right, Jed match, same things we looked at before. It's a great place to collaborate and it is free. There are some services that charge $10 a month. So go wild for a month, it's only $10. It's a great place to upload. We do need to appreciate there is a login and a password required. Um, it's, it's a very stripped down kind of site, but their tools are amazing either free or $10 for the month. Now, there have been some changes there because of the scandal that occurred a few years ago about how the data was shared with law enforcement agencies. And you will also be asked to sign a waiver. If you don't agree with that, you won't be allowed to become a member of GEDmatch. If you do sign the waiver, then be aware that your DNA could be the source of breaking a cold case or identifying a killer who went free. And I'm okay with that. Not everybody is and you don't have to be, but just be aware, okay? All right, so you can accept, reject, or decide later. Reject, you don't get to be a member of GEDmatch. Decide later, you don't get to be a member of GEDmatch. So it all works out that way. Do you get assigned a kit number and write it down somewhere where you don't forget it? Uh, these are the different kits. These are all, in the old days, they used to give A for ancestor kits, M for uh, 23andMe. Uh, I think that's right. Yep. Oh, good. That was a test and I passed. Yay. So you can see that they did that. They don't no longer do it this way. I don't know why. So here is my husband's results, my results, and uh, a woman that I thought was my half sister from one father. Uh, family trees. I did upload my family tree. Uh, you can say this at one point in time, you could say, no, the police can't use it. Now, of course, you can't even join. But you don't have the option. So you upload your information by GEDCOM. GEDCOM is like a taxi for taking your information and transporting it from one place to another. It's very easy. So download your GEDCOM file if you have a tree and use uh, your, with your DNA and then you send it there. Okay, GEDCOM is not GEDmatch. Okay, two different things. 
<coughs> Jed comma is a taxi. Jed matches the site. And then when you upload your information, you're going to get this lovely permit print out with all these emails and names, but they're kits. You can see that you can still see if they've been up there for a while. Here is a link to useful YouTube video. One of the things that we don't use often enough, it's been proven, are the training videos that come with all the DNA sites. Please, if you have a curiosity about DNA or you're trying to get better at it, please access their training videos. They are not always interesting, but they are exact. So here is a kit number, and you can see that we have the largest segment is 30, uh, 824. If you were to look that up, we're running a little late. Um, you can see that. This is someone that I'm related to. All right, we're going to just move on. These are different tools. Um, it's right on the front page when you, after you signed in, you can't miss it. It's all free. Tier one, again, um, it gives you some other tools and toys to play with. Steve, you can do phasing and triangulation like we talked about that Ancestry can't do. Uh, here is a tree, <laughs> here is a percentage that they showed from GEDmatch, and you can see I have a little bit South Asian. There's the Caucasus still, North American Indian, and Arctic, that tiny little, that's a little lot bigger than the other was. Siberia has shown its face every now and again, Mediterranean, East Asian, West African, North European. They are very specific when you look at and you have your ethnicity read by GEDmatch. Now let's look at a few more um, few more tests. All right, this is your regular AT DNA family tree. I'd like you to look, here's you. This will be your father, okay? And here is your mother. Here is her, her mother, and it goes out from there. Here is your her father and it goes there, All right? So we have, you can see the relationships by the shades, All right? But there are other things you can test for. Family tree DNA is the only one, all of them do AT, AT DNA testing, but family tree DNA is the only one, well, living DNA does too, Y DNA and NT DNA, right? Y DNA traces the direct father's line for 25 generations. I don't have 25 generation of names to go with that, but I did have my husband and for some reason my son because I just wanted to see what would be different because he's got part of me in him, um, traced him. And it was really very, very helpful because my husband has a very unique um, Y DNA. All right, but for 25 generations, but it has to be a straight line. There can't be a stepfather in there. There can't be uh, an oops, which is a non, you have that non-paternal event, which means someone is thought to be a child that really isn't. It will skew it but it will take you directly back from father to son for 25 generations and gives you the haplogroup, the migration group. So here's the Y-DNA inheritance right here, one line. So why would I use the Y-DNA? Well, if I'm looking, if I have a brother and we don't know who our great, great grandfather is, I would definitely have him test Y-DNA. There are three different sizes or technically four different sizes, different expenses for Y DNA, but you can see that on uh, family tree DNA. All right, here's MT DNA. This is the maternal line. You can see that it could be technically taste tested for 52 generations. So that's good to know, but it is definitely, there's a change here though. See, it's mother to grandmother to great grandmother straight up the straight up the female line except for the son the sons of the mother are also blessed with her mtdna so if you are trying to find someone if you're trying to find a great grandmother a great great grandmother and you haven't been having a lot of luck um, or you're helping out a friend and she doesn't have any daughters but she has a son the son can take the mtDNA test, and then you can begin to search uh, for relatives. So you can see that you have one male, and then there's the, his mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. So that is the only exception there. 
So when we look at this, and we don't really have enough time to do that, but you can see where we looked at this before. And here's my research question. Who is my adopted great-grandmother's mother? So here's the adopted great-grandmother. Here's the taker. We know who the daughter is because of the DNA testing, comparing of centimorgans and segments, all right? But now we need to try to find other relationships. Who needs to be tested for the mtDNA? I hope you're all saying direct line women, except for the son. Now, if some of these are direct line, but they've passed on, but their son, if they have a son, if no daughters are there and they have a son, that can be used, all right? So you keep going back there and then you find, how does tracing the lineage forward helpful? Because you have to know who these people are and their relationships to this. And who is this? The most recent common ancestor. So all those cousins that we don't pay a lot of attention to sometimes are the key to finding out that most recent common ancestor that you may be looking for. All right, so inclusion, starting with me. There's all these things. Knowing why we test impacts our choices. Are we testing to find our ethnicity? Then definitely test, upload, download and upload. You'll, especially to GEDmatch, you get some very specific information there, but you'll also get different information by going to the other company. Ancestry has both strengths and weaknesses. Their greatest strength is the price of their test and they have great sales. The tools on Ancestry are fun, and we'd like to say they're for genetic genealogy research, but they hardly are because they're really based off the trees. And people who don't have trees don't get the same results on any of their tools except for the matches. Okay, having a research plan, what we're trying to do, we're looking for specifically state, I want to find this ancestor, whether for whatever reason. Then we begin to find people that we're related to, we begin to contact them, we try to talk about shared ancestry. And then we're beginning to understand who they're related to. They may not know who they're related to, but we can figure that out, especially with centimorgans and segments, right? Downloading is free. We want to do that. Researching beyond ancestry, we want to do that. Centimorgans are the key to evaluating relationships. Yes, unless there is endogamy. Again, beware. GEDmatch does what ancestry doesn't, but some people are not fond of their stance and their choices but it's a great side if you're good. learning the principles. Practice on your own DNA evaluating. Come to be very comfortable with the number of centimorgans and um, that you have with someone else. Look at it, decide it, look at up, download and upload. I cannot say that enough. So then idea, identify your genetic information. What is, um, what is your haplogroup? What does that mean? And now then compare it to someone who's close. Begin to organize your information, use a table. How many centimorgans do you share? How many segments do you share? Then you can use your phasing and your visual phasing. You can also use some of the other tools and find out which, which segments on which chromosome do you share? Reference genetics with genealogy, they go hand in hand. Remember DNA evaluations will continue to change. Um, our results will continue to change. Why? Remember the recipe. The recipe is different from different companies and also their control group is changing through the year. So that means that they evaluate it differently. The most current information we found on scientific papers, which are not easy to read, blogs and sites. Highly recommended blogs and that's why I put them on your handout because they write in a language that we're familiar with. Test them out if you're interested in DNA. Test them out and see who speaks to you. Who is easy for you to understand? If you are looking for a parent um, and you don't have a lot of money, um, you can't, obviously you can't hire an expert then, but remember Search Angel. Search Angel is a group dedicated to helping people find their parents or their children in this case. Um, and they do it for free. It's a service. That's why they're called angels. DNA is being used for good. So learn from others. Explore Facebook. Some of you may not think well of Facebook. Facebook has a bajillion sites for genealogists and for genetic genealogists. Um, join some groups and just keep up if you can. If not, 
don't keep up, but every time you read something, you're going to learn something and you're going to retain something. Google DNA blogs and you'll find several. Give it a try. Explore the tutorials we talked about. Subscribe to Family Tree Magazine. Great genealogy magazine. Simply written. Never talks down. Easy to understand. Attend seminars, institutes, conferences, conventions for education. Streamed conference speakers are available. Now, this is the most part, and that's what the most important part here is that I bolded it. Webinars can be found on YouTube. Ginny webinars, American Ancestors, Family Search, all of them are free. Free, free, free. Free, free, free. Legacy, however, is not free, but it's still not expensive if you think about the cost of going to a movie and the cost of joining Legacy with all of the wonderful international and national speakers that have a lot of experience in um, helping explain. DNA to us. So this is the phrase I used uh, when I went to YouTube using DNA in genealogy or even just Google DNA genealogy. You'll get a lot of understandings, a lot of titles that you might be interested in, people that you're going to find are your favorites and go with that. I also highly recommend your DNA guide, the book by Diane Southard. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember um, when my children were young, there was a series of books where you could choose the ending. Um, you could choose the ending. Um, DNA guidebook works a little bit like this. You do this, you find this out, you have a choice to go A or B. You go A and then you find this out, you can go back and try something else out. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing, brilliant, inspired book. So at the end of your handout are some ethics questions. And I definitely encourage you to sit down in a quiet place and think about them. Uh, the ethics are, are not prescribed by anyone, but there is some more and there is moral overtone to it because we should always be aware um, of something that and how we're thinking, thinking about someone else's point of view. We never want to take advantage of that. So there is importance in small steps. Here's the, on the right, we have the big step person, big chunks right there, and they can hardly even get started. Here are the small steps, and the person is way up there. I recommend that we think about genetic genealogy in small steps. It's fun, it's a little overwhelming, but the more we learn, the less overwhelming it gets. So questions and answers, it's already 7.30, however, um, or almost 7.30, so you decide and uh, what you want to do about that. But my name is Patty Gillespie. I'm the owner of Family Lines and Stories, and I think DNA is really cool. So we will just get back to where we need to go. Um, okay. Hey, Patty. Yes. On that um, last couple of slides, that legacy that costs money, is that the legacy webinar? Uh, yes, Legacy actually owns a tree type thing, you know, a uh, personal, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. Now, I always... It's Legacy Family Tree Webinars, is, is, isn't that what it's called? Yes. Okay, um, yeah, they, they, they do have some great webinars, and um, if you watch for, they have sales too every now and then. I think even this year, because they got what? up to a certain number, like 1,750 webinars on their site. I don't know if their sale is still on, but it was for like half off which is 25 bucks for half off. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm having a hard time getting back. <laughs> I don't know what the problem is. Uh, I don't want to resume the share. So pause share, stop share. There we go. Yay for me. There you are. Okay, I am going, are there any questions? There looks like there's nothing on the chat right now. So let's see if I can unmute. Uh, no, I don't want to. Yes, so you can unmute yourself if you have any questions for me. Thank you, Kate, for the compliments. I know that there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, there's a question here I don't understand from Nancy. I don't understand the concept of O DNA, zero DNA matches with my parents. 
but sharing DNA with their parents. I agree. There's, there's some things to consider there. Um, and um, thank you, Sharon. There's some things to consider there and you probably should have a conversation. Um, or if you're talking about like what I had on my site with my mother and my father, that's different from another question that you might be asking. So if you have some more questions, my email is on the handout. So please contact me and we can have a conversation there that's a little more private um, if we need that. Uh, so, all right, let's see. Need to go meeting conflict break. Oh, thank you, Robert left. Um, Ashkenazi, yes, that was probably it. Um, any questions? We've been here for a long time, longer than our bottoms like to sit, but uh, if you have a question, you can always email me. I'd be happy to answer it. Uh, and then, Vanetta, I need to talk to you afterwards. Okay. okay. I thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, this program has been recorded, and it will be available for a, a short period of time. And uh, if you need to go back over something, if you need the copy of the handout, make sure you can email me at president.tsgs at gmail.com and I will send that out. Uh, and other than that, if there's no more questions, thank you all for attending and have a good night. Thank you. It's so much fun to be back. Thanks, Patty. I really enjoyed your presentation. I did have to, I did have to step away, but like you said, it's, it's really starting to sink in, even though oh, I good. haven't gotten my report or anything yet. Good. But hearing these terms over and over again, it's, it's starting to sink in, and I really like the way you presented it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's very kind of Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Patty. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you. It's been great. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Cleve. Sharon. Okay, when they come out. Okay, they're all muted. So, Vanetta, there was a gal that came in two minutes before, maybe three minutes before I was finishing, mm -hmm. and I didn't let her in. Okay. Um, so, if you get any blowback from that, I just want you to know about it. But oh, that that's okay because uh, they hopefully will look for it whenever it's time to or it's up for uh, them to view. So, how long do you think it'll take to get that converted or in? Or just when you download it, you're going to email it to me? Or how are we doing this? Waiting for you to finish the question. <laughs> it was a long one. I, I was, like you said. It was. It okay, this bit. is what happened. Um, <laughs> okay. I sent a link. I will send the link to you. And then okay. you can post the link, and then they can access it through Zoom. Okay. I, I Like I said, I spend no time editing. I do not edit. Um, okay. I've never even had anyone ask me to do that before. So that's really interesting. Um, so that should that should take that as soon as I when I get the link, and usually okay. it will come tonight. So I have a very long day tomorrow. It might not be until Thursday because when I walk okay. in Wednesday evening, I'm usually shot, and then I don't do anything except watch TV. All right. Well, if you get it sent to me on Thursday, I probably won't put it up till Friday because I got a really busy Thursday. Yeah, so see? But, you totally understand, I, don't you? Yeah. But that that way, if there's anybody still on here listening, they'll understand that it won't be up until Friday then. So okay. that would be right. good. All okay. right. Okay. Thank we'll you. we'll get that check sent out. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank Bye. you. Have a good night. You too. Bye.